Good morning. Welcome to the last day of the event. Uh, my name is Ivan Judson, uh, and I am a, I used to be a software engineer. That's not an apology yet. I am now a program manager. Uh, I used to work in research and in evangelism, and now I'm on a product team. Uh, however, that move has been really good because I've moved into an IoT product space within Microsoft. So part of the work that we've been doing over the last few years, we're going to present uh, to, to talk about sort of cool development and opportunities that we're, we've been working on. Um, and I will pass the mic and let my colleagues introduce themselves. Hey guys, my name is Rita Jane. Um, I'm an open source engineer at Microsoft. Um, so my day-to-day -day job is essentially um, hacking on GitHub. I'm working with open source communities, startups, and basically anybody who wants to um, um, enable their stuff to work on any Microsoft platforms. So whether that's Windows or Azure, um, that's where my team comes in and, and help unblock developers. Um, so, and prior to joining Microsoft, um, so I've been at Distro about a year, and prior to joining um, Microsoft, I had my own little startup. Um, it's a smart home device. Um, and so I'm very passionate in this space. Um, and as we go through the talk, um, I'll also share a little bit of experience about how to take a, a prototype and um, make it into production. Hi, everyone. My name is Pamela Cortez. I'm on the incubation team, so I get to work with really cool, new, innovative products like HoloLens, and my focus is IoT, and I'm also an open source advocate. I recently joined Microsoft. I used to work at Spark Fun Electronics. I don't know if you guys have heard of the company before, but uh, super um, open source. Uh, so I'm excited to be here today. All right, a couple of things we're going to do. So we left time at the end for questions. And we have a few kits. So if you ask a question at the end, you may or may not end up getting one of our three kits. It's our way to try to encourage you to stay to the end, which shouldn't be too hard, because there won't be coffee for a while. So uh, think of questions. We'll, we'll left, we left about 10 minutes at the end to try and deal with those. Uh, we'll do the best that we can in answering the questions. Um, a little bit of introduction. We, uh, Rita and I spent three days in Shanghai last last month, uh, working with Espressif. So the 8266 is one of the items that is in our title. The 8266. What's that? Just curious, how many people have used it before? How many know of the 8266, and how many have actually you you guys have all used it? Sweet. Uh, that's that's amazing. That's great. Um, so the CEO of Espressif spent a day with Rita and I working on looking at software, looking at opportunities, how can we partner, what can we do, um, and told us a lot more about what's going on with the company. And it was a great day. And then we spent the next two days actually working on porting SDKs and getting code running with them. And so today we'll talk a little bit about uh, that, the outcome of that process. I don't probably need to describe much of the SP8266 to you because you've all either heard of it or used it. So I'll skip past this part of the introduction. Uh, I miss it. <laughs> makes it easier. Um, and I'll, I'm going to give sort of a big, big picture view of IoT at Microsoft. Um, I'm going to use some fairly boring slides to set context. But I want you to understand sort of the way that we think about the problem. So Microsoft is a big, monstrous-sized company. We have a lot of moving parts. We have a huge amount of software development and, uh, and hardware engineering that happens in Redmond. We have a large field team all over the planet doing all sorts of engineering development and then you know, sales and services that we all try to stay about arm's length from as much as we can. Um, but in the big picture of IoT, which is sort of a very generic term to begin with, we at Microsoft think about it in two parts. We think of the cloud part of IoT, and we think of the client part of IoT. And typically, if you're inside the walls of Redmond, and you're talking about IoT in the client, you're probably talking to what we would refer to as the Windows and Devices group, so the, the group that builds the Windows operating system. Um, that really doesn't fairly represent the client ecosystem in the entire world. And so what we're going to talk about today is how, if you work on the cloud side of IoT at Microsoft, 
the cloud's perspective of client is actually open source. So I'll go through a bunch of how that works and what that looks like. But, um, but in both cases, on the client side with Windows, we do ship this thing called Windows IoT Core, which I have to at least give them uh, some visibility because they've built on the basis of something we called one core. So it used to be, if you're familiar with OSs and internals, Windows had a different basic version of Windows for every piece of hardware because it was so messy and complicated. We've evolved over the last few years into defining what we call one core, which is a single set of APIs and services that then are installed on every machine that runs Windows. And then there are flavors and variants that sit on top of that. And the reason that's interesting is because, in fact, Alljoin, which is another Linux Foundation project recently merged with OOI, I don't remember the right Intel acronym at the moment, but recently merged with the uh, Open con Connectivity Framework, I think is the right way. That, uh, what's that? Yeah, OCF. So OCF and Alljoin merged and announced on Monday that merger. Um, they'll both be housed by the Linux Foundation as a new single project. Um, and in fact, Windows 10 was the first version of Windows to ship open source software as part of the operating system. All join is baked into Windows 10. So we actually have, and I worked on that for a couple of years to try and make sure that we got that stuff out and our developer ecosystem works. So even though Windows IoT Core is Windows and it's really heavyweight for a lot of devices, it does build on that kind of core and there is an ecosystem of openness around it so that tools and libraries can still be used there. On the cloud side, um, how many of you are familiar with Azure? How many of you are, uh, okay, so I'm gonna give you the one minute version, which sets a groundwork for understanding the IoT part of Azure, which is what I actually spend my day job doing. Um, so this is Azure on one slide, and it's an old slide, so there's actually a lot more moving parts now. But the more important thing is that this is our, the IoT part of Azure, which was one box in that slide. So Azure it has our data center. I'll, I'll go back just so that I can be at least a little bit nice about it. So in Azure, we have our data center infrastructure. So we've got 30 plus data centers all over the planet. We've got federated ones. We've got jurisdictionally uh, compliant ones. So we have a data center here run by Deutsche Telekom. We have data centers in China that are, that are uh, exclusive to the Chinese infrastructure. Um, we have other data centers around the planet. We have a huge amount of infrastructure and we're bringing them online at an incredible rate, um, insane amount. On top of that, we have infrastructure services, compute, storage, and networking. Um, our three sort of common infrastructure components we use are, are blobs for sort of blob storage, queues for sending messages back and forth, and tables are sort of the basics. And then on top of all those infrastructure pieces, we've got a bunch of platform as a service components like everybody else. Um, they span from networking to machine learning and big data. That's kind of the, the, the big description. But in the IoT space, we actually have a bunch of components that I'm working on the team to help build and refine. And in that space, we talk about the, the sort of device and cloud patterns, you can ignore sort of everything from here to that side. That's how businesses use IoT. Everything from here to the left is the parts that we, we build in Azure. So we have gateways, protocol adapters, field gateways, which are proximal, so things out in the field, and then device support. And if we drive down into the actual way that we implement that and the way we manage that, this is how, what we refer to as our reference architecture. It's a lot harder to see up here than it is on the slide, so I apologize, but I won't take all day going through it. Um, this, is, this is that right-hand side of the slide, the business part, so presentation and analysis. This is kind of the device and event processing piece in the middle, and then transport and device and data sources. And so if you've got an IP-capable device, we have a client library, existing IoT devices, we've got libraries that, to interact. If you've got a device that can't do IP, maybe it's a Bluetooth device, it can communicate over its normal way to a gateway. So that proximal gateway, it might be a Bluetooth to IP gateway. It may also do protocol translation. We've got SDKs for the gateways so that you can build a gateway in software and run it wherever you want. 
And you can also do protocol translation in those from MQTT to HTTP or whatever you want to do. Um, at this point, everything then connects up to the cloud, and that's all in the cloud pieces. And the reason I wanted to point this out is because one of the, ooh, perfect. One of the last things I wanted to show is that for each one of these boxes where I say we have, we have SDKs or libraries, you can actually find those on GitHub. So we have uh, an Azure GitHub organization. And under that organization, you can see here's our IoT SDKs. Within the IoT SDK, which is written in C, and it's C99, it's relatively portable. It's been ported and compiled to a bunch of different platforms. Um, in there, we also have wrappers for other languages. So there's a C-sharp wrapper and NuGet packages for the world of people that love us and have been doing our stuff for 30 years that I actually haven't met a lot of because I'm from you, this community. Um, there's Python bindings. There's other bindings from the C to other languages. Um, there are some solutions. So this is a remote monitoring solution, which means it's a whole com set of platform components that work together for you to monitor your devices and determine when there's a failure or something's going on that you need to pay attention to. But then down, in the, uh, down here, you can see we have a protocol gateway and a gateway SDK. And these are open source SDKs, MIT licensed, available for anybody who wants to build a component that doesn't live in the cloud but lives in the infrastructure out in the edge. And so our approach from the Azure IoT point of view is we try to build the parts, the platform as a service components in Azure as well as we can and then provide C SDKs for our partners to build on and try to, try to build their value in the place that they own the market, their customer engagement space. And so uh, at, that, at this point, I want to transition and, and let Rita take over and actually show you some of the stuff based on this sort of foundation. If we take the ESP8266 and the pieces of Azure that are interesting, what can we do or what can you do with those components? And by the way, for the people who showed up late, we're giving away kits if you ask questions. Great. Um, so, uh, so given that this talk is about um, expressive hardware, um, I, I guess most of us have developed on ESP8266. Great. Um, so, so as we mentioned earlier, um, uh, you know, one of the things that Microsoft is trying to do is to enable um, developers who may not necessarily be the traditional Microsoft developers. Um, so not everything is C sharp. Um, so if um, so, later on, I will walk you guys through um, our GitHub repos um, and kind of demonstrate that now um, it, for developers like us, you. We don't just rely on C sharp applications, um, but also there's C, there's Python, there's Java. Um, you know, for the JavaScript developers out there, um, and so and and in addition to that, um, we uh, for someone who uh, is not, you know, as you can see, my day to day is on a Mac. Uh, I use Docker. Uh, to build my uh, binaries, um, and I use uh, we have something called VS Code. Um, who, who knows about Electron? Um, so it's a great. It's an open source um, platform that allows you to develop applications that just run uh, cross platform. So now with this um, essentially this uh, IDE, you can run this, uh, develop your code, compile, debug all um, with this application uh, on whether you're using Mac or Windows or Linux. Um, so I'm going to quickly kind of walk through um, our, as Ivan mentioned earlier, so this is um, something we are living and breathing in every, sorry, what happened? Oh, every day. Um, and as, as Ivan mentioned earlier, as you can see, uh, we're offering SDKs in pretty much uh, all the languages that that developers love, um, and and as you can see with the uh, SDK for C, um, this is where, you know, what I think uh, f for folks who are really trying to make their product, uh, make their prototypes into production, um, actually um, make 
consumer products or in, in industrial pr products, this is where you really get your hands dirty. And this is what, how actually we, um, why we it partnered with Expressive to make sure their SDK actually works with um, Azure uh, C SDK out of the box. So that um, any developer, when you come in to this SDK, um, uh, you come in to C, and as you can see, we have um, in here, uh, as Ivan mentioned, uh, these are the platforms that we currently support, um, but we're continuing to work with partners and um, uh, open source communities to make sure we add more support to this. Um, and it, initially, we have, you know, of course, Windows and Linux, but slowly we added like uh, embedded systems. And, and in the future, uh, as we are working with Expressa, we're adding ESP8266 to this. So, um, and we're working with the product team to get that upstreamed. So the experience essentially is a, when a developer comes in, um, you know, they come in here and then they run some shell, shell uh, script, and then that basically. Uh, ports all the, uh, sorry, let me just get out of this. Uh, now let's look at some code. So, so essentially the experience is that you're in here and you get the, um, you know, the Azure C utilities, the code into your project. And in addition to that, you also get um, the, the, the different protocols. So for example, it comes with example code for uh, AMQP, AMQTT, uh, HTTP, so on and so forth. Uh, so as you can see in here for the client code, um, you can actually start with some of these examples and then just add your own code to it. Um, so what we've done is we've, we've uh, created an example for MQTT for ESP8266. Um, uh, so the develop, so this is VS Code, as I, as I showed you guys earlier. Uh, so it's like, a, it's a nice little, uh, little um, editor. And as you can see in here, you can basically, I'm on a Mac and you can use this for Windows or Linux, doesn't matter. Um, and then uh, for, the, for the building your binaries, um, you know, we, we heavily use, um, leverage the Docker community uh, for uh, the awesome uh, images that's already been built by different folks. In, and as you can see, uh, this guy basically created uh, Docker con uh, images for 8266 and as well as 32, uh, the, the successor of 8266. And as you can see in the Docker file, what, what, uh, what we're able to do is essentially bypass all the complexities um, taking uh, what you normally would have to do uh, and just basically build a, a Debian image, uh, including your GCC or Python uh, dependencies uh, for those of us that um, basically have used a build images for ESP, you, you basically need your ESP tools. So once that binary is built, uh, then you know you run something like this. Uh, which is ESP tool Python, where you're f flashing your binaries to the actual hardware. So I'm just going to run a quick example. Uh, where is that thing? I can't find. Oh, God. Where is this application? Uh, you guys see? All right. <clears throat> So I'm gonna quickly kind of um, walk through what the experience is like. So while she's setting up, how many of you actually know of the ESP32, which is the new, the newish board? Okay, great. Uh, so it depends on what it's running as its OS firmware. And I would say that the prioritization by the product team is outside of what 
these guys are doing that's on my team side, and I don't actually have any idea what their prioritization is today. Okay. I know that we are working with more and more kits and hardware solutions and more vendors, um, but really we're driven by market, right? And so one of the things that we've learned, and I don't know whose point I'm gonna divulge inappropriately because I've jumped in, is uh, the ESP8266 is shipping an amazing number of units. The volume's going through the roof. They're, they're not far behind Atmel in terms of volume, which is alarming given that they're only three or four years old in shipping the 8266. And Atmel has such a history with the Atmega series, right? So the fact that they're getting huge amounts of uptake means that their volume is, that people love them. That's a great win for us if we can make sure that their stuff works well, seamlessly, no one has to do anything, there's an obvious advantage there as opposed to going with some of the other vendors we've met with who are shipping you know, in the millions, but low numbers, right? So it, the prioritization is difficult. Um, if you send me, we'll have our contact info at the end. If you send me a specific question about hardware, I can get back to you with details. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Uh, so they'll, can we say, that, well, let, let's hold that to the end because we have, we have we 10 minutes for questions yeah. and we are going to talk about that. I just, I don't want to give away everyone's stuff before they have a chance to talk. <laughs> yeah, um, so once you, once you flash the binaries to the hardware, um, I mean, you guys probably all have seen this, uh, but basically this is the, ah, this is the t tool that we use to test that our device is actually streaming data to uh, Azure or any and any server for that matter. Um, so, so this is a little Node.js client tool that um, that you would use to look to uh, look at the data that is being streamed to Azure. Uh, so, in this case, I've opened up uh, just to kind of look at the data that's being passed around. Uh, so, what I'm gonna do. Let's come back here and then just turn this guy on. Well. Something is wonky. Yeah. So this is basically getting uh, uh, SNTP time from uh, SNTP server. And then once it figures out that, then it streams some data to um, Azure. And um, uh, when, when, while that's happening, as you can see, the data now is coming over. Uh, I'm just gonna shut it down. And then on here, uh, the, the developer experience is, uh, this is what we have uh, on Azure. It's a nice little portal for you to manage your devices. And it also allows you to kind of monitor what's going on with your devices, how much data you're streaming. And in real time, you actually get, so let me re refresh this page. You actually see, sorry, what? Yeah, um, so you actually like, shows you that you, now you got more data. And this is also where you can do um, a lot more uh, things with your data. Uh, so for example, uh, what we also see is uh, as a developer, now that I've I basically created a prototype, but if I really want to take this to production, I have to be able to ma to do something with the data that I got and be able to have an end-to-end -end solution. And with with um, and what we've done, um, if anybody actually attended our uh, workshop yesterday, uh, it, that's kind of the experience that we've we're, we've demonstrated is that so now I've demonstrated that we stream the data uh, from ESP to eighty two sixty six. Uh, using the C SDK, and it streams the data to the IoT Hub, as you can see from the portal that I showed earlier. Um, <clears throat> so here you get the data, uh, but then coming back, oh God, I hate this, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so, what you get is essentially an end-to-end -to -end toolbox of 
tools and services at your fingertips so that you're not only just streaming the data, but you're able to actually do a bunch of queries, uh, do some processing on that data. Um, you know, if you want to do moving averages or aggregation, this is where you can do that. Um, and that's where, uh, you know, stream analytics comes in. And then here's for the folks that want to do like machine learning or uh, use Spark to do uh, some aggregation, you can also do that here. And all of this is actually hosted on Azure, on Linux, VMs. Uh, so it's very much open source friendly. Uh, and then once that's done, then you can uh, source the data to an event hub where it also has SDKs that you can use to create applications that subscribe to the data that you're pushing out. Um, and that's where you know you can write your own JavaScript applications, and you just basically do something, present the data, and in you know, a dashboard or so on and so forth. And what the other nice thing about um, IoT Hub is that you can actually use that to provision devices, and you can actually um, allow it, allow it to um, you know send data to your devices as well. So that's kind of the uh, the developer experience, and I kind of I realized that I just did the demo. Uh, I I can never keep track of myself, um, but essentially that's that's kind of what we've what we've done with Expressive because we want to make sure um, developers can now utilize um, Azure SDKs and, and to actually make pr real products out of out of these devices. Um, so we we, we demoed uh, the eighty two sixty six experience. Um, and then, and, and earlier, sorry, that was using MQTT uh, protocol. Uh, sorry, I'm jumping around, but uh, just kind of want to show you quickly. These are the available protocols today. Um, so now let's talk about the successor, uh, ESP32. While we were in Shanghai, um, the the Espresso was nice enough to give us um, new devices to play with. Um, and uh, where is that? Yeah, sorry guys, I'm jumping around. So this is um, ESP32. Um, it's uh, a more, I think it's more, definitely more powerful and um, a lot of people in the industry ha have been waiting for this guy. Um, it's, it's uh, so, so for the folks that have used 8266, as you know, it's a Wi-Fi module. But now with 32, you have Wi-Fi, you also have Bluetooth. So you can actually build applications not just for Wi-Fi, but also Bluetooth. Uh, the both supports both Classic and um, BLE. And what's nice about this guide is also that it um, 8266 has 80K of memory, but now with 32, you have uh, 520, I believe. Yeah, um, and it basically allows you to add more features in your application. So it's a very tiny but very smart thing that does s simple things for you. Um, and what is interesting is also uh, they've added um, additional hardware encryption capabilities. Um, and because it's more, it's dual CPU processor. So now because it's more powerful, you can actually use it for audio video processing. Okay, uh, I think, oh, right, demo. So I'm just gonna do a really quick demo. We have not integrated this guy to Azure yet, but just um, we have blog posts about you know how to get started with ESP32. So as a, while she sets up her demo, uh, another brief interjection is uh, we did a full day workshop yesterday. We had a few people come through and they built the entire end-to-end -end themselves. If you're interested in seeing that content, which is available for many different hardware platforms, Raspberry Pis, ESP8266s, Particle Photons, and a bunch of other stuff, you can go to thinglabs.io. It's a website that we host sort of cur curriculum we're developing that we provide. And it has links to a bunch of stuff, but you can follow along, buy a kit on your own, and go through the labs and do all this stuff to see how this works. <clears throat> and then um, this is also the hardware spec. If you if you're interested in uh, the the actual hardware features and and schematics, 
Um, and then here is you know where Espressive basically put out um, instructions how, how to set it up on Linux, uh, Windows, and Mac. Um, and I've written a little blog post about how to get started. Um, so in my case, I because I'm using a Mac, so I, I I'm actually using a VM uh, to uh, map the serial port and then flash the binary to to this little guy. Um, so let's see. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is just kind of start this guy, and then as you can see, wow. Okay, so it basically got the, okay, it's too quick. Uh, oops. Okay, yeah, so it's got, it, it's able to get the Wi-Fi uh, in this conference, but in this conference uh, Wi-Fi, and then I just added some data just to stream it out so you guys can see it. Um, and basically, that's that's pretty much it. Can you show the code? Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, okay, so. So here's like a really quick example. Um, and what I did was um, just, you know, you provide the SSID password. And then um, here's the a little bit of, uh, you know, some data you want to output. And then um, and here's the Linux VM that I ran. Um, and I, I don't think we need to go through the whole process. But essentially, you just use a VM and then map the port and then um, it actually comes, wow, nope, uh, I think I need to like, oh god, I think I just broke it, okay, it's not happening, but basically, um, they actually have this tool that you can, uh, you can specify the menu configuration, it looks something like, it, like this. Uh, so, so basically, once you map the port, then you here. This is what it looks like, and you specify like what port you want to use, uh, the bot rate, and then the SPI mode, and the SPI speed. And then once you specify that, then you can just run make flash, and that actually builds the binary for you, and then actually flash the binary onto this board. If any of you have built a Linux kernel, it's literally the exact same. <coughs> Yeah, and then and then it, it looks something like this, and you can like it basically t tells you what status is at, and it's done flashing. Um, and once that's done, you know you can just use um, a Explorer to test the code. That's pretty much it. Um, so this is all great as a developer. I have all these awesome tools with me, but how do I actually get one of these? It was almost a smooth, smooth uh, transition. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to talk about our, our partnerships uh, that we're doing in the, the open source space, especially with hardware. Uh, so for those who said they've been working with the ESP8266, uh, has, have you guys got the Adafruit version? Anyone use that one? I see a couple heads. Oh, OK. <laughs> so we've actually been partnering with uh, different hardware vendors like Adafruit, SparkFun, Seed Studio. And Microsoft has a history of you know working with tons of OEMs and hardware partners. But we really wanted to be able to work with partners like Adafruit and SparkFun, C Studio, and many others that are leaders in the open source community. And also, for example, Lamore Fry, she's, she's amazing. Uh, she was, she's considered the top five females uh, for IoT, who's making a huge difference in this community. So for the ESP8266, a lot of people ended up just getting that the, the breakout board, and she made a actual development board that was really easy to use that board with. 
So we partnered up and did a bunch of starter kits with these partners. And with the starter kits, they're super easy to get started. They're all open source hardware, uh, which is great. Uh, when I was developing hardware for SparkFun, uh, we open sourced all of the boards. Uh, so you could actually take that footprint and then make your own board, add sensors to it and everything else. So if you wanted to go from proof of concept to production, it made it a lot easier because all the files were open source. Uh, so we have example code and libraries all hosted on GitHub. Uh, the, the content, too, as Ivan has mentioned, is on GitHub as well. Uh, and it's also great to prototype for makers, but also R&D engineers, especially when you want to do rapid prototyping. It helps a lot to just grab one of these boards, hook it up to whatever sensor you need just to get it working um, as a proof of concept. So I'm going to go from idea to product. Um, I get asked a lot about the Raspberry Pi, and then people are like, I made a product based on the Raspberry Pi. Now, how do I take that into production? And that's, that's, a, that's a long answer to that, just because uh, the Raspberry Pi, it's depending on what you need for your production run, it, it could be difficult. So it's we're working on giving out more information and support for the Pi, but also letting people know how to take your proof of concept to production. Uh, for example, we worked with SAM Labs um, in our accelerators uh, for them to not only learn how to do their idea to production and work with OEMs and be mentored, uh, be mentored but also be able to get business help as well, which is a huge part of it, because it is a leap to go from that. Uh, because uh, has anyone bought anything on Kickstarter before? I love Kickstarter. Um, <laughs> it got to the point where I was I was buying jeans and clothes and and yeah, um, but so they. Kickstarter is great, but if it gets super successful, you know that it takes a really long time to actually get that board. Um, I, yeah, let's. I've ordered plenty of development boards where it took it over a year to get it because a lot of people don't think about. Uh, okay, the supplier, maybe the supplier will be able to accommodate for you know the hundred k units that uh, was on my successful Kickstarter, and chances are they won't be able to. So that's where we come in to help out with labs, programs, um, and also work with the open source community uh, to <coughs> provide content that helps out uh, taking the, the idea to production. So now I'm going to talk about outreach, because I'm on the developer experience team. Um, and what we do, we do a lot of uh, fun events. Uh, my job is. We get to play with HoloLens and a bunch of cool new things that are coming down the pipeline. Uh, so this is an example of one of our hackathons. And it's really important to us to be able to go out to the developer community and get feedback. Um, and so no matter how harsh or um, positive it is, we want to hear it. Uh, so if any of you guys have any comments about any of our stuff, please uh, reach out to me or Ivan or Rita. Uh, so this one, they were, uh, this team actually did an IoT scenario with uh, HoloLens and uh, Little Bits. And Little Bits just makes it really easy to connect different sensors. It's also made for uh, kids, too. Uh, but it's easy to do rapid prototyping. So we have a lot of our community on hackster.io uh, doing tutorials and open sourcing the code. And then, has anyone heard of Microbit by chance? Have kids. <laughs> uh, so we worked with uh, 30 different partners uh, for open sourcing, creating an open source board with BBC to get this in the hands of every year seventh. Uh, so I, think, I believe that's like eighth graders in, in the US. Uh, a board, a microbit board. And so Microsoft did a lot of the development for the programming experience on that. And not just on you know, C Sharp, but on Python, Java, and a bunch of other stuff too, and drag and drop programming. So we have the 
pxt.io, um, and that's based on Google Blockly, and it's, it's very much like Scratch, where it's drag and drop, but what's important here is that we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. There's already these amazing open source projects that's going on, so being able to identify those, work with that community, and then uh, contribute back is really important to us. And also, this is an EDU outreach, too. And with the boards being open source hardware, uh, teachers can create shields for it. We even have a shield that helps it go to space. Um, and it just helps that community, which is really important. So. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, please give any feedback, uh, and we are really trying to make our content uh, showcasing that Azure works on all platforms. You might notice, even like a year ago, a lot of our content was Raspberry Pi, but it had Windows 10 IoT Core. But now we're building uh, content that showcases on Raspbian, um, how to hook up the temperature sensor to go to Azure and everything, and also the ESP8266. And there was a question about vendors for the ESP32. There are vendors in the pipeline, um, and that's all I'm allowed to say. Um, <laughs> but there, that board is definitely going to be huge, um, and we'll have a lot of support for it as well. I think it's, it's also helpful to know that the uh, sort of log jam in the supply chain around the ESP32 is that they're still really early in the life cycle of the 32. There have not been a lot of units manufactured. Uh, but mm -hmm. as that volume goes up, you'll see them probably through many of the same places you see the other starter kits. It's just early in its life. That was a better answer. I liked your answer. <laughs> uh, and I'm just going to be the one who says, whoever has questions, uh, I can give out kits. Does anyone have any any questions? Or you can make up one. Duh. We have three. <laughs> uh, a colleague of mine attended uh, the workshop yesterday, and he loved it. And he was yeah. completely new to adopting Azure Container Container This is squarely in my team's purview. Um, and I would say that we have an emerging, we've made announcements, and you'll find public web pages around device management and provisioning. Over the air updates, whether it's firmware or software, falls into that sort of feature case. And you, there's a story that will be told in the next few months that will be much more in depth and detailed around that. But I, it is completely fair for me to tell you, without divulging any trade secrets, that we have a plan, we're rolling it out, and we're working with anyone who's interested at this point to help us refine that plan so that we have maximum impact. So if you want to follow up with me, um, feel free to drop me a note. I can tell you what, what I can tell you what I can tell you, but I can also listen to you and make sure that gets into our product team so that they deliver something that's useful for you. And that's one aspect that I want to highlight in the questions. So while you're thinking about questions, uh, all three of us work in a sort of different uh, cadence, a different relationship. Even though I'm on a product team, I was in DX previously. Um, we, our, our goal is actually not to give you a tool and have you just run around and try to solve a problem. Our goal is to listen to your problems, find out where you're having gaps. And the point that Pamela, the point that Pamela was making about identifying things is we want to find the gaps in the community and help fill them in in a way that it's open and collaborative. And we actually work with partners in like hackathons where we host a hackathon yeah. uh, where uh, we help get funding and we work on your work and then we just help build something big. And we help build on that and we'll actually get over to it. So one thing we ask is that well, whatever we do, we want it to on blog be as friendly and as whatever we do is just open source so all the people can take it out. More questions? Wow. Three hands, two kits. We'll sort it out. Who? Yeah. I think the guy in the back wins because no one could see him. What's your question? <laughs> What's a good start point for 
A, a proximal gateway or a protocol gateway or both? A protocol gateway. So um, my, I have a colleague, his name's Chapalo. He's on the product team. He actually owns the uh, protocol gateway SDK. There's some samples in there. I don't know how complete they are, but you should see a, a lot more detail in that rollout in the next few weeks. Um, but I would say, and I hate to keep saying it this way, but um, follow up with me and I can get you the freshest answer to that question directly from him by putting you in contact with him. And he can recommend a development path, which will be whatever platform you're on, let's get the SDK working there and then get the examples of the protocols we have and then work with you to understand what your protocol priorities are. There may be tools we can use already to get you going really fast. That's my goal. So that's where I would start. You have a question. So this came up in our, our workshop yesterday, and it's kind of an interesting answer, uh, which is our MQTT support, which is kind of our, our becoming our primary protocol in the IoT space. Um, the payload is application dependent. So it's up to you what you put in the payload. If you can put JSON in it, and it will work sort of seamlessly, you could put binarized payload in it, and then you just have to decode it on the cloud side in your infrastructure. Um, so in IoT, one of the things that we've made a very clear decision about when it comes to scale is that we do not want to actually crack open your payload ever because that takes time, which makes it slower. So you'll notice that most of the time we, we delegate that responsibility to the application infrastructure. Like the, the things you have to build should crack open the messages and deal with it. We'll give you some filtering, but mostly only on header. We don't want to look at body ever because it's too much processing. So that's our that's our stance. And then you had a question? I just wanted to check what the license support was on the logic. It's all open source. So our preference on all of our SDKs, and I'm gonna say this and then question myself because that's how it always works, is that we prefer to push all of our code using an MIT license. Um, we, we don't generally work with a GNU license in any way, shape, or form um, because we can't push to our partners viral licensing and we can't in, ingest it. Um, yeah, but MIT, if you, uh, we've gone through an evolution from BSD to Apache to MIT. So you can imagine that by knowing that evolution, what our sort of opinion and where our politics and, and lawyers line up. Um, trying to make it as broad of collaborative impact as we can while protecting the IP we have to. Um, any other questions? We have two more kits and I've forgotten to hand them to people. So, you, there you go. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> and one more that I'm gonna let them hand out to someone. Uh, we do have more. So if there's a handful of you that need a kit, we can give you kits. So the question about the cloud side. Yes. So it all depends on how you decide to do it. The problem that, we, that I would say we all have in the cloud space is we all represent sort of infrastructure at the bottom, platform in the middle, and software at the top, all as a service. And you can pick which components you want to use and kind of build your solution as Legos. And the trade-off is cost versus maintenance. How much time do you put in it or how much do you pay for it? At the bottom with infrastructure, you put more time and less money into it. At the software as a service layer, you put less time and more money into it. it. The components all work together. It's really a solution and a business problem to optimize that. So the current uh, cloud application, what is the solution? Am I thinking about the VMs or you provide proper templates? So our reference solutions around like remote monitoring and predictive maintenance integrate platform as a service components that you would pay for the platform and they pre-configure sort of the scale. So you'd pay sort of a, a, a single line item price for a scale implementation. Yeah. 
we're working because we do more external facing in engagements on trying to make sure that we have that if we can in every case that there's a service that someone would use we have a free tier to get started which may be a very small scale but it at least lets people get started running an end-to-end -end example with maybe a single device to understand how it works and then they can understand the cost choices of the various components. That's not entirely true today, but it is true for some parts. So there, the IoT hub, which is a, one of the components, you can actually instantiate a free tier and get 8,000 messages a month currently. So it's, there's some, a money question. So how much your uh, solution requires to, uh, to publish out? Can I use private? So all of our stuff that we have if we have deployed services into the private clouds, i.e. into our like German cloud or Chinese cloud, um, we'll work there if the services are deployed. There's no technology difference. It's literally only a security sort of issue. And, and so that's the, that's the Azure rollout implementation timeline issue. It's, it, the intent is that they're all available everywhere. Yeah. Last question, I think. Yes, repeat that question. I don't have that detail. 32, right? I don't actually know that yet. I, they're shipping now, and I think it's just working with the fab to scale it up. I don't, I'm not sure. Do you have a second question? We, we have that detail, but we'll follow up after. It goes into an incredibly low power deep sleep mode. Like insanely low power. It's in the specs that we can, we can stand outside and get coffee so that we're not blocking anyone. And we'll show you that. <coughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I would say that it is possible but fraught with nightmares to do it with the 8266 because the processing power is and the memory constraints are so small. With the 32, it's not only possible, but it's easy. And the feature I would say I want to talk about, highlight the most out of the 32, because I think it's insanely awesome, is that the 32 actually has a memory protection unit and a secure section of memory that you can embed like a client cert or client credentials in, and if anyone messes with it, it'll wipe itself and become unable to communicate or connect to a place to get recertified. So it has dual core and tons of space, and it can do definitely encryption on the fly. The 8266, uh, it might not actually be able to do anything else if you did that. <laughs> Uh, so as soon as the as the uh, as soon as the products are announced by our partners, it will work, because Reed is making it work right now. <laughs> so as soon as you can buy it, it will work with the SDK. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? We'll be out there to follow up. These slides are on slides.com and they're already published. You can uh, slides.com. So it's a revealed JS. And the event website will have a PDF version. Yeah. So, um, anyway, we don't need to run into the next talk. Thank you guys. We'll be here for a little while to answer questions. But thanks for coming. We really appreciate it.